Hello and welcome back to yet another GCSE revision lesson. Now I made this lesson specifically for the Edexcel gang. In other words, for those of you who are going to be sitting the English language paper 2 exam according to the Edexcel syllabus, I want to show you guys how you can craft a perfect response for section B, which is the transactional writing question. Now this question carries a massive amount of marks. It's worth 40 marks in this entire paper. Therefore, you do need to allocate a significant amount of time to this part of the exam. And of course, even going into the exam, you need to be able to anticipate what questions and what forms of writing you should be questioned on so that you can prepare in advance, know the form, know the layout, and also most importantly, know what to talk about, okay? Now, remember, when it comes to transactional writing for the Edexcel exam, you always get a choice of two questions, okay? You always get two questions. It can either be an article, a letter or a speech or whatever, right? You're given a choice of one question, question number eight, and then another question, question number nine. Pick one, don't do both, okay? Now, when it comes to this portion of the exam, remember that you should try to spend at least 45 to 50 minutes on this question simply because it counts towards 40 marks of this overall paper, therefore it will make or break your mark. Now, this particular part of the exam always tests your awareness of form, audience and purpose. What do I mean by form, audience and purpose? Number one, when it comes to form, it tends to test your awareness of, for example, if you're asked to write a speech, do you know how a speech is laid out? If you're asked to write a letter, can you illustrate an awareness of how a letter is laid out? If you're asked to write a leaflet, a guide, even for instance, sometimes in very rare circumstances, you're even asked to write things like travel guides, are you able to demonstrate an awareness of form when you're writing out your response in relation to the question that you are given, okay? So that's the first thing that's really, really important. You need to know and to show a demonstration of your awareness of form, okay? That's the first thing. However, of course, closely tied to form is audience, right? So you might be asked to write a letter to an MP. You might be asked to give a speech to your peers. You might be asked to write a travel guide for people who are going traveling. You need to write in a way where you're pitching to these different audiences, okay? So for instance, if you're writing a travel guide, you need to write in a really exciting way, perhaps adding a little bit more informality because this is uh, something that you're writing for somebody who is reading it in their leisure. They, want, they don't wanna read something that feels like an essay. This is very different to the audience that would be, for instance, a letter to an MP. You're writing an incredibly formal way, okay? So of course you also need to demonstrate an awareness of different audiences, but of course also most importantly, you need to show an awareness of purpose. Purpose simply means, are you able to fulfill the primary purpose, which is to inform regardless of the form that you're asked to look at, right? Regardless of whether it's a letter, an article, a speech, a guide, leaflet, whatever. The primary purpose of what you are writing, remember for transactional writing, is to inform. The secondary purpose is to entertain. Hence, when you're writing these different forms of writing, you need to write in a way that's quite engaging for your reader. You need to write in a way that's quite captivating from all the different letters that they could be reading, from all the different speeches that they could be sitting through. Why would they pick yours in particular? You do so by making it engaging even from the opening rather than starting your speech with, I am writing the speech for, or starting your letter with, I'm writing this letter, or even for example, a guide. This travel guide, I'm writing this travel guide to inform you about this country, that's boring, okay? So you need to also illustrate an awareness of purpose. Primary purpose is always to inform, secondary purpose is to entertain, okay? Now, as you can see behind me, there are different color codings for the different forms of transactional writing. What I want to show you guys is actually when it comes to transactional writing, you don't need to stress out too much as to what's gonna come up in the test because you can literally anticipate, okay, say if, I get to, uh, if I'm asked to write a leaflet, this is the layout and this is the form that I need to demonstrate. If I'm asked to write, for example, a guide, this is the layout. If I'm asked to write a speech, this is the layout. So I'm gonna walk you through that right now before and then walk you through the different techniques and devices you should include in any transactional writing and to show you actually, it's actually quite straightforward. Once you understand the form, there's actually a very standard approach that you can take for any question that comes up, okay? So I'm gonna walk you guys through that before I then show you one model answer that I have prepared. So, the first set of forms, which to be honest, you can use exactly the same layout, is if you're asked to either produce an article, a leaflet, a guide, a review or re report, 
I would argue that you can take this specific layout and this form, this six step form for either of these different forms of writing, okay? So if you're asked to produce an article or a leaflet or a guide or review a report, start off with a title or a headline. Right at the center, keep it to five, maximum six words. To make it easy, you can look at the keywords in the question, turn that into a rhetorical question. That immediately informs your reader that, you know, what the article is about, what the guide is about, what the report is about, okay? So, irrespective of what comes up, start off with your headline. Then in your opening paragraph, this is where you address what you're supposed to be talking about, okay? When you're again starting either article, leaflet, guide, review, report, do not start by saying, in this review, I will talk to you about this book that I've most recently read, which is really, really interesting. That's boring. Do not start by saying, in this leaflet, I will tell you the importance of volunteering. That's really, really boring. A good way to open your paragraph and to fulfill the secondary purpose of making your writing, your transactional writing entertaining is think about the opposing view. Try to create a sense of conflict. Maybe for instance, let's say you were asked to produce uh, a, uh, an article based on the importance of traveling, for instance, or why it's really good to travel or why we should have really um, important possessions, right? You can then begin by stating there are many people who don't think possessions are really important. There are many people who don't think traveling is important, but I disagree. I think traveling is powerful. Traveling is important. It's engaging. It's enriching, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay? So in your opening paragraph, do not start with in this article I will, in this leaflet I will, in this review. It's boring. Try to make it entertaining and engaging by presenting perhaps a counter view. Then you say, actually, even if some people think this, actually, I'm here to tell you why it's really interesting, why you should, you know, um, if it's a travel guide, why you should travel to Japan, for instance, okay? That's your opening paragraph for either of these. Then include your first subheading, break up the text, make it easy for your reader to digest what you are writing about, okay? Subheading is really, really brief. It's just a mini headline, okay? Five or six words long, think about what you're gonna talk about in your preceding paragraphs, then just kind of create a very brief subheading. Then, this is the most important aspect of transactional writing, this is where students make this work way more complicated than it needs to be. In the question that you get, you always get bullet points, you get a minimum of three bullet points. So you're asked to address the question, and then you're given by Edexcel very, very helpfully, three areas within the bullet points that you can focus on use them for your main body paragraph. So now, after you've added your opening paragraph, your subheading, your main body points would literally be, first paragraph, your first body paragraph, would literally address the first bullet point. Go into detail based on that bullet point. Then your second body paragraph will literally address the second bullet point in lots of detail. Then your third body paragraph will address the third bullet point. Edexcel has literally given you, within those three bullet points, your essay plan, okay? So use that. Use that to help you, okay? So then, of course, once you're done with your, all your main points, maybe add a second subheading to just break it up, make it easier for your reader's eyes to glide over your article, leaflet, guide, review, or report before you finish off by closing your discussion. Now, when it comes to a letter or an email, I've grouped them together because they're basically to do with corresponding with somebody, okay? So irrespective of whether you're asked to write a letter or an email, this is the standard approach to take for this transactional writing task. Start off with either for your letter, writing an address, so of course add the recipient, um, MP John Smith, 1 Westminster Way, Westminster London, SW1 1KB, right, so this is a made up address, or if it's an email, add your email title, okay? So for instance, let's say you're writing uh, an email to your MP uh, regarding why uh, environmental um, pollution is, is a big issue, right? So then the title would be, um, environmental pollution, colon, what do we need to do or what we need to do, okay? So something really basic, something quite straightforward, okay? So you either go for either of those depending whether it's a letter or an email. Then of course, just for your letter, include a date, right? The day that in which you're writing, don't make up some fictional date in the future, just write the date that you're writing this particular letter. Of course, you don't have to add a date for an email. Then for both of them now, okay? So now this is the standard approach, either a letter or an email, this is what you do. Dear whoever, you address the person that's receiving that letter or that email. Then you go into your opening paragraph, introduce the issue, make it really interesting. Don't say, in this letter I will talk about, or in this email I will talk. It's boring, okay? Try to make it engaging, try to make it interesting. Then your main body paragraphs, when you go into lots of detail as to why you take your approach 
is literally again guided by the bullet points in the question. Bullet point one, two, and three, that's literally what goes into your main paragraphs. So your first body paragraph is what you're asked to talk about and to address in the first bullet point in the question. Second body paragraph goes to the second bullet point. Third body paragraph goes with the third bullet point. Before, in your email or in your letter, you add a closing paragraph to close off your discussion and then finish off by signing off by saying kind regards, your name and surname, your sincerely. I personally prefer kind regards only because it's really easy to spell. The final form to, bear, to pay attention to is a speech. You might be asked in your transactional writing portion of your exam to produce a speech. Again, speech is super easy, super straightforward to be clear on in terms of form. Now, when it comes to speech, remember you always begin by addressing your audience. So for example, if it's a grown up audience, you say ladies and gentlemen. However, if you're writing this speech for your students who are listening to you, do not say ladies and gentlemen, address them as fellow students, not boys and girls, say fellow students. Then have your opening discussion, opening paragraph, introduce your speech. Do not start off by saying, in this speech, I will talk about, that's boring, you're gonna send your audience to sleep. Make it engaging. Then once you're done with your opening paragraph, literally your main points once more, just like an article leaflet guide, review report, as well as letter and email, you literally just follow the same framework. You look at the bullet points. Think about bullet point number one for your main body paragraph. Bullet point number two for your main body, for your second body paragraph bullet point number three for your third body paragraph. Literally, that's how you approach it. So you start fellow students, then your opening paragraph, introduce the issue. Then your main points are bullet point one, two, and three based on, so your body paragraphs address each of these bullet points before you, in your closing paragraph in your speech, you round off, you know, I hope I've convinced you to think about things from my perspective. And then the final step in the speech that students always forget is thanking the audience and by thanking your audience literally just a sentence saying thank you for your time and attention i hope you've learned something new that's it that's the perfect way to end your perfect speech now the final thing is you might be looking at this and saying okay th that's great it's great to know all of these different layouts and all of these different formats but i've heard of deforest i've heard of direct address i've heard of rhetorical question i've even heard of statistics and anecdotes how does that work in as you can see here literally irrespective of what you get in your opening paragraph and your main body paragraphs you need to make sure you're including literary and persuasive techniques firstly when it comes to literary techniques this is stuff like direct address for example talking directly to your reader or your audience using pronouns like you also using inclusive pronouns like we i think we can all agree all of that makes your writing engaging or even your speech entertaining for your audience other literary techniques include things like similes, things like metaphors, also your long and short sentences, your rhetorical questions, all of that count as literary techniques which bring your writing to life. However, of course, there's also persuasive techniques you need to include in transactional writing to make your audience or your reader feel convinced to take your approach. Persuasive techniques are made up statistics, okay? Again, you don't know what's gonna come up in the question, therefore the examiners understand that you don't know all statistics about the topic that's gonna come up. Just show that you know to persuade your reader or your audience, you need to add a persuasive element, which is, for example, uh, giving the study, saying, this is not just my opinion. Actually, according to Cambridge University, 75% of people who went on holiday were really happy. 60% of people who read a book were really uh, intelligent, for example, okay? I'm just making up statistics on the spot, but essentially what I'm saying is that when it comes to transactional writing, make sure you also add persuasive devices. Statistics is number one. According to Cambridge University, according to gov.uk, 55% of people, blah, blah, blah. Use also realistic made up statistics. Don't say 100% or 0%. Even in real life, there's never 100% agreement on something or 0% um, disagreement on something, okay? It's always somewhere in the middle. Another persuasive element and another persuasive device is anecdote. Anecdotes are really, really powerful. Statistics are really good because it shows that it's not just your opinion, it's shown in the general population. But one thing about statistics that makes it a limitation is it's very hard for us to visualize what a statistic looks like. However, what an anecdote does is it brings that idea to life by visualizing, or by enabling us to visualize what that particular anecdote is. In other words, an anecdote is when you pinpoint one particular person who's affected by the issue that you're talking about. Let's say you're talking about the importance of travel, say, and then you say, let's take the case of Sally Smith. She's a year 11 student who last year went traveling to France. Me giving that really particular anecdote 
enables my reader to imagine and visualize how one particular person is affected by the issue that you are discussing. That's really deeply persuasive. Another persuasive device is just giving a range of examples, talking about, you know, let's think about this, that, and that, going to my travel example. Let's consider the budget airlines, EasyJet, Ryanair, Wizz Air, okay? That's another persuasive device. And finally, of course, very closely tied to anecdotes. You can even say, for instance, John Doe in an interview with the BBC said, I think traveling is really good. Okay. Again, all of this is made up, but you're showing an awareness that when it comes to transactional writing and you're writing in a debate, you need to make what you're writing about convincing and compelling by showing it's not just my opinion. Actually, here's an anecdote. Here's a statistic. Here's some examples. Here's an interview that shows that, you know, not only do I think in this way, but actually other people think in this way. Okay. So hopefully that makes it easy to understand what the requirements of transactional writing are. It's literally as simple as just following these forms within whatever question that you get. Remember, you get a choice of two questions pick one, don't do both, and then literally just default to whichever form that you want to take, okay? So now that you have an understanding of transactional writing, I'm gonna show you a worked example and a worked model answer, and you'll see how I applied this framework and this approach, and especially how I use the bullet points, bullet point one, two, and three, to guide my response. So let me show you how you can apply this framework to the transactional writing question that came up in the 2021 exam. I'm going to select one of the questions, but then show you guys how you can apply this framework. So I decided to go for question number eight. And as you can see, I've already started this question and I've highlighted the keywords in this question. Now, this question asks you to write the text for a speech you will give to your peers, persuading them to volunteer with the charity. Already, if it's a speech, I already know I'm going to be addressing it using the speech format. And of course, the speech is for my peers. Therefore, I'm going to start off with fellow students, then my opening paragraph, then my body points led by these bullet points before I close and I thank my audience for listening. So going back to this question, you're asked in your speech to include ways your peers can volunteer, what kinds of charities and people they can help, and reasons why it's important to volunteer. So as I mentioned, firstly, you need to obviously demonstrate an awareness of form. In this case, I've got to write a speech, but also most importantly, I need to address these bullet points and the easiest way to approach it, and I'm also showing my Edexcel examiners that I totally get the assignment, I know what I'm supposed to be answering, is literally in my main points after I've introduced the topic, which is why it's important to volunteer with a charity, I literally will address it chronologically. My first main body point will be ways I can volunteer. By the way, guys, you can write one uh, body point for each bullet point, or for instance, if you write, say, two points, but relating to just ways they can volunteer, you can do so. You can write two points for this and two points for that. It all depends on your writing speed, okay? How much you can write between 45 to 50 minutes, but you're still using this more as just a general essay plan, okay? So just, first bullet point, you're thinking, okay, after I've opened my discussion, I'm going to definitely have to talk about ways they can volunteer. So now here I'm going to think about different examples I can use to show ways people can volunteer. I'm also going to embed some made up statistics, say, for example, maybe for the second bullet point or the, for the third bullet point. I'm also going to include some anecdotes and they can go in either of these, okay? But as I mentioned, do not restrict it to just one paragraph per bullet point. It's more, for instance, you start off the first point, your first main point, First paragraph, second main point, second paragraph, third main point, third paragraph. But it can be first two paragraphs, volunteer. Second two paragraphs, ways um, and what kinds of charities people can help in. Third paragraph or third and fourth paragraph or fifth, sixth, whatever can be the final, okay? You're working through it chronologically. So let me show you my model response for this speech. Of course, I begin by addressing my audience. Hello, fellow students. And of course, that therefore means I'm showing my examiners that I'm aware who my audience is. It's my peers, not grown up individuals, okay? So then, of course, I need to introduce what I'm talking about before I launch into these bullet points, okay? So that's my opening paragraph. As you can see, I'm not going to begin by saying, I am here to tell you this speech about, that's boring, you're gonna send your audience to sleep. Try to make it entertaining. There's one thing and one thing alone that I want to emphasize. What is it? It's your duty to volunteer with the charity. There is nothing more fulfilling than helping those in need. Volunteering is necessary for us as young people. Some of you seated here may feel skeptical. You may think that I'm, what I'm saying is, non, is utter nonsense. You may wonder whether it's possible in your packed schedules to squeeze in time for a charity. 
You have school, then after school clubs, there are many, uh, ch there, uh, there may be chores to do at home. It is impossible to make time to volunteer, yet it's possible. We waste so much time on TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, Twitch. We all have spare time to give to others. Volunteering will make us feel better about ourselves while improving someone else's life. As you can see in my opening paragraph, I've not said I am here to do this. I'm using literary to techniques and literary devices to make my audience pay attention to me. I'm also using things like direct address, so using pronouns like your, to make my audience feel included. And I'm weaving in and developing my argument by using a mix of long and short sentences. You need to make sure you're doing that consistently as you're developing your speech or any other form of transactional writing. Now I've introduced why I'm talking to them, that I'm here to persuade them to volunteer. And even if some of them disagree, right? So, you know, I've addressed that. You may think that what I'm saying is utter nonsense. Even if they disagree, I'm about to now launch into these three bullet points and why they should volunteer. So here's my first bullet point. There are a plethora of charities to choose from. I'm addressing the ways they can volunteer and what kinds of charities. Children's charities, animal charities, homeless charities. Pick a charity that aligns with your passion. Nonetheless, you may be wondering, what are the ways in which I can volunteer? Firstly, you can help charities fundraise. Charities always need money and sponsors. In fact, gov.uk, my made up statistic, found that 80% of charities that shut down last year failed because they simply ran out of money. An hour or two of your time fundraising can save a charity and keep its doors open for the needy. So of course here, I've literally stated, you may be wondering what are the ways in which I can volunteer. I've used the rhetorical questions here to show that I am addressing very clearly bullet point number one. And of course, as you can see, I'm using a mix of rhetorical questions, long and short sentences, but also now I've added a persuasive device. I've made up a statistic, gov.uk, which is the government's official website, but I've made the, this up and said, okay, this is why it's so good to volunteer. Then I've then developed my speech. Another way you can volunteer is helping with the day-to-day -day functions of the charity. You can help charity workers with administration work, like cleaning up office supplies and filing paperwork. You can even turn your talents into something that can boost a charity forward. Again, pay attention to the fact that I'm using stuff like alliteration, turn your talents. I'm using uh, a mix of different sentences. Then I'll ask a rhetorical question. Are you obsessed with TikTok? Perhaps you can help the charity open up a TikTok account and manage their social media for them. I've asked a rhetorical question, then immediately answered my rhetorical question. We call this hyperfora, very powerful persuasive technique. In fact, Jane Doe, here's my made up anecdote, who's now in year 11, told me that last year she worked with cancer research. She helped them set up their TikTok page, which now has over 100,000 followers. Yet your volunteering does not have to be flashy. You can visit a soup kitchen and ladle lot soup to hungry people. You can help poor families in a food bank. The options are endless. I finished off with a brief, simple sentence, but also used hyperbole. These first two paragraphs are after my opening paragraph. I've dedicated my first two paragraphs to the initial bullet point, which is ways they can volunteer. So now I'm gonna go on to talking about the different kinds of charities. There are hundreds and hundreds of charities to choose from. Worried about endangered animals, rhetorical question. Volunteer at WWF. Keen to help the elderly, second rhetorical question. Support Age UK. Are you an animal lover, third rhetorical question. RSPCA is always looking for volunteers. Passionate about protecting children, fourth rhetorical question. Go and volunteer at RSPCC. There are over 100,000 charities, made up statistic, in the UK alone. Pick a charity that resonates with you. You may still think volunteering is, point is a pointless waste of your time. Pick a charity, give it a week. You may find it hard to contain your excitement as a volunteer once you realize how rewarding this kind of work is. So this is the ways they can volunteer. You may still be skeptical. Now here I'm addressing people who don't want to agree with me. Yes, volunteering is great for those you serve. They are in need. Your help will make their lives better. However, what's in it for you? What will you gain? If you consider volunteering from a selfish perspective, volunteering is a fantastic way to clear your state of mind. You may struggle with feeling down and depressed. You may have mood swings. You may think your life is depressing and repetitive. I've used tricolon here. I'm talking, I'm using three separate sentences to show why people might not want to, you know, might want to um, volunteer in a charity in a way that selfishly benefits them. Volunteering will change that all. As a volunteer myself, I am amazed at how happy and fulfilled and grateful I am each week 
after working with the elderly at Age UK. So now here, I've brought it back to myself once more. I'm showing my reader, or rather my listener, because this is a speech, how also this applies to me as a speaker. There are so many lovely older people. Many no longer have their parents. Volunteering makes me grateful for my family and friends. Volunteering will also give you a great work experience and social skills. For example, so now here I'm giving an example. Volunteering in a charity shop will arm you with patience. You will learn how to speak to people of all ages who come in as customers. You will learn how to cope with pressure during busy times. These are all skills you will need in your first job in the real world. So I've addressed in my second to last bullet, uh, paragraph, I've addressed this final reasons why it's important to volunteer and I've also weaved in why people might also disagree with me, okay? So I've also not only added in a counterpoint, but I've then said, actually, these are the reasons why it's important to volunteer. You can do it from a selfish perspective while still helping others. Now I'm gonna finish off my speech by thanking my audience. I hope you'll consider being a volunteer. It's rewarding, it is challenging, it is worth it. Try colon. I hope you'll sign up to help a charity. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope you've learned something new. Students always forget this final bit where you need to thank your audience for sitting there and listening to your speech. Make sure you show an awareness of your audience, okay? So that's really it when it comes to how to approach the transactional writing question. Use these bullet points that you're given as a guide. It's literally almost like an essay plan that Edexcel is giving you to help you along this work, okay? To help you in your exam. So make sure you make use of it, okay? So I hope this helps and thanks so much for listening.